Thank you for tuning in to Macro View Television and welcome to a brand new edition of Taiwan Outlook, the program that presents the different faces and lets you hear about their stories on Taiwan. I'm your host, Wu Rei Guo. Since it's founded in 1985, the Asian America pageant has been the longest running in the United States. And today on the program, we are delighted to have the 2015 Miss Asian America to be here as our special guest, and she is Stephanie Lin. We're going to talk about women's empowerment and also promoting gender equality in the program. Welcome to our program today, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Raymond, and 各位观众朋友,大家好. Hello, thank it, you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on the program, Stephanie. And as I mentioned, you're the 2015 Miss Asian America. Correct. And, uh, but other than that title, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? For example, where were you born? Where did you go to school? And what do you do now? Yeah, definitely. I'm happy to provide the whole recap. <laughs> okay. um, basically, I was born and raised in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, Shiku. Good. And right. um, I actually went to the same uh, college as you, UC Berkeley, Go Bears. Yes. Um, after graduating with a degree in mass communications, that's mm -hmm. on Bo, and right. a minor in Chinese, I moved out to New York to pursue a career in broadcasting. Okay. Um, and I actually was a journalist myself over um, for the at local NBC affiliate for a few years. Okay. Um, and then I was bitten by the startup bug. Um, and I wanted to sort of uh, partake in the storytelling and the conversations that were happening back out in the Silicon Valley. So I packed Good. my bags, moved back out to the Silicon Valley where I started working with um, a variety of different video game startups because okay. my passion is also you know, video games. Okay. And um, so I grew my career as a marketer um, in the in the video gaming start startup space. Mm -hmm. And then um, most recently, I was the director of marketing for a global venture capital firm called 500 Startups. Okay. And now I'm um, here in Taiwan to sort of mentor different startups here in Taiwan, understand and learn more about the startup ecosystem, and sure. uh, do what I can to basically help out with my expertise in marketing and storytelling. All right. Yeah. And as I mentioned, at the beginning part of the program that the Asian America pageant is mm -hmm. the longest running in the United States mm -hmm. since it was first begin mm -hmm. in 1985. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about the pageant itself? Mm -hmm. And uh, only, of course, the title suggests only for Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be some of the other qualifications about the background of the pageant, please. Right, um, that's a great question. So you're correct, the pageant has been around for about 30 something years yes. now, and I'm so honored to really be the first Taiwanese American to um, be awarded the title of Miss Asian America in this landmark milestone of a year, yes. uh, the 30th year. Um, and basically, when you're in the competition, you're actually competing with women all around the world of all different ethnicities. Of course. Koreans, uh, Japanese, Thailand. Um, so it's really a wonderful sort of uh, way to get exposed to a lot of different types of Asian cultures. Yes. And what I found really fantastic about mm -hmm. participating in this entire mm -hmm. competition as well mm -hmm. is the fact that every single woman, um, you know, we represent a platform, a cause that we uh, believe very strongly in. And for me specifically, it was championing for more women in the fields of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, mm -hmm. whereas say for other women, it was, you know, we want to, I want to stop, you know, drunk driving, or, okay. you know, I want to encourage people to volunteer at the local animal shelter. Okay. And um, so, in a nutshell, that's basically what the competition's about. You go through right. this sort of uh, several go through month different long, stages. Yeah, yeah, several month long process. Preliminary first. Yeah, you do the interviews. Uh, there's a bit of a pre preliminary round, um, and uh, you also kind of are like a politician almost. You go out and you campaign for yourself. You get your friends to sort of you rally support from your friends. Of um, course. I actually fundraised um, through like a bartending session at a local Ooh, bar to okay. for a charity to support my cause. Okay. Um, um, as you know, to, in the running to become Miss Asian America, so okay. um, it was a, a ton of fun. All right, basically. but you know, at the time you were working as well. I mm -hmm. mean, what what were the circumstances or factors that mm -hmm. prompted you 
to participate in the pageant? Yeah, so at the time I was uh, leading uh, product marketing um, okay. at a gaming company, right. um, working uh, for uh, on, on a big, uh, basically Star Wars related game, okay. uh, which is pretty cool. All right. um, and, but, uh, and, and you're right, it, it was a lot of responsibilities, right? Like having to sort of like run for um, Miss Asian America and sort of juggle a full-time job, right? Mm -hmm. But ultimately for me, it was really about championing Ta the Taiwanese American culture and okay. sort of my cause. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. So in that aspect, it was definitely very rewarding. Okay. Um, Good. So, but like to go back to your question, could you uh, mm -hmm. um, rephrase again? Yeah, of yeah. course. I mean, I mean, were there people involved in the pageant that maybe brought it to your attention? Hey, Stephanie, you may have the qualifications. Why don't you, you know, mm, participate? Yeah. So, were, were there anything like this? Yeah. So basically, you know, before I was, I've always been very involved in the Asian American community in the Bay yeah. Area, mm -hmm. and I was president of a group called a Taime Jingying Xie Wei, uh, Xie right. Wei, Taiwanese American Professionals. Oh, right. And so I was president of that for a time, and through that, I actually met the organizer of the Miss Asian America, Miss Asian Global Pageant. Okay. And uh, she approached me and she said, you know, I think you might be a, potentially a really good candidate for uh, participating in, yeah. in, in, in this in competition. The past, yes. And at the time, I was trying to figure out, you know, what is sort of a unique way to get the word out about, you know, Taiwanese American culture and also, of course, champion the yeah. cause that I care very deeply about and have fun exactly. at the same time. It's yes, pretty of unique yes. to say that you <laughs> right. participate in a pageant. So. All right. And that combination doesn't come across every day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah it was a pretty unique situation. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, how often do you come back to Taiwan? Do you have relatives still in Taiwan? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have a lot of cousins here, oh, uncles, okay. aunts. Um, uh, right. My parents actually came over to Taiwan to visit with me. So, oh, okay, good. Um, yeah, right. I have a lot of relatives out here. I try to come back at least um, once a, a year. Yeah, at least once a year, once every two years. Okay. Um, and then I'll, I'll try to stay at least a couple of weeks, if not a month. All right. Yeah. And you, of course, in Taiwan this time is on behalf of you know Miss America. Asian America, you know, pageant. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your mission? in Taiwan. Yeah, so, um, you know, I came back, um, well, not only to represent the Miss Asian America pageant. Of course. Um, and to showcase, like, hey, you know, we did it. Like, the Taiwanese community, we came together, and now we have the first, you know, the ta first Taiwanese American to win uh, the Miss Asian America pageant. Not only did I come back to kind of, like, celebrate mm. that with my friends and my mm. peers here, okay. um, but, you know, I came back to also help out. You know, um, again, it's kind of contributing my experience in marketing and technology to okay. help local startups here, mm -hmm. um, you know, be able to find that global audience, to be able okay. to help build their businesses. All right. Yeah. And uh, let me ask you this. I mean, since coming to Taiwan, have you been able to travel around the island? On oh this trip. man, uh, I <laughs> wish I had I had more time to do more of that. Okay. Actually, it's something that I'd love you to. You probably got a very busy schedule. Uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> but every time but, you yeah. come back, do you go to places like night markets? Mm -hmm, yeah. yeah. What is your favorite food, yeah. for example? And do you um, watch TV since you got the journalistic background? Um, yeah. So I do watch a fair amount of programming here, but um, I've been spending most of my time if not sort of working with startups and you know doing the whole media interview thing uh, definitely eating at okay. night markets <laughs> right. so i think i've been to siling yes si and siling night market of course also hua i think that's where mm, they do the okay. the, the, the infamous temple. snake yes. uh mm. the snake soups yes actually i i actually did that i partnered with a local <laughs> startup city but they actually approached me they said do you want to you know, go on, uh, experience sort of a local tour with us. And of so course. they took me to Huashi Night Huashi, Market. Yes. And uh, I actually tried some snake soup, and that was very interesting, okay. <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. Well, other than that, what would be some of the regular Taiwanese food that you like the most? Mm, uh, I love nyoro mian. Okay. And um, obviously the classic uh, boba nai cha. <laughs> okay, of course. So, yeah. All right, mm -hmm. Good. And uh, what else would you do in Taiwan on this trip? Other than what's being, you know, asked you to do by the pageant, and also you want to talk to the local startups, mm -hmm. and uh, any other additional activities you have planned for yourself? Um, I would say just doing the best I can to spend quality time with my family. Okay. Um, you know, uh, working in the Silicon Valley and running the pageant circuit, and mm -hmm. just championing this cause: women in STEM, more women in technology. 
and interviewing founders and getting to know them for yes, my you know online program sandbox mm -hmm. i mean that's so much and you know being able to have set aside some free time to travel and just be with my family is is valuable and i want to try and okay yeah. uh, have you found out something on the you know this particular trip that is new and different mm -hmm. from what you remember from the last trip or previous trips mm. uh, for example a Taiwanese startups uh, a little more global looking now or yeah. is it you know because of the you know tensions have you know de-escalated with mm -hmm. China mm -hmm. that people are now looking you know to go to China market not only to penetrate in the local market mm -hmm. there in China, mm -hmm. but also through China to go through the global market. What is your sense? I would say in general, my observation about startups here is that, you know, first of all, the startup ecosystem here is pretty young. Like yes. I, I would say the last seven months is mm -hmm. when it's actually started to become more of a thing here. Uh -huh. um, I think there is a lot of passion and interest in, okay. you know, a lot of people to start and grow their own business. Okay. Um, at the same time, I think that, you know, people need to sort of have more of an awareness awareness of the mm. importance of um, building a business that is global and not mm -hmm. so locally focused. The only okay. way that you know startups are going to be able to attract that much needed investor funding okay. is if they build a business that can scale globally. Of course. And I think that a lot of the start a number of the startups that I've spoken to and been exposed to, they're only thinking about building like their the businesses locals. locally. Mm. And it's like, well that's great if if you if you want to just open your local <laughs> coffee shop, but <laughs> if you really want that investor funding, think about trying to scale something globally. Okay. Um, so that's a, a, sort of a key observation that I've seen. All right, we're going to talk a little more about that in later parts of the program. Sure. But also, let me ask you: I mean, in terms of the local startups, uh, are they still in STEM fields? Are they mm. looking into some other areas as well? Mm. So um, the startups that I've been exposed to. Um, sort of run a whole range of across different mm -hmm. industries. Very diverse. Um, okay. I actually, but if you want to speak specifically about um, something that falls within the fields of like high tech, STEM, uh -huh. uh, some a startup that I met up with, with uh, really recently uh, is called Code Mentor. Really, okay. really interesting. Um, their okay. founder um, is fairly well known locally. His name is Waiting Lu. Okay. Um, and he's backed by Code, uh, by uh, tech stars and also 500 startups. And what's really neat about his startup that I like is the fact that uh, he it's like a live marketplace for developers so mm. if you want to learn to code for example you can go on to code mentor and you can basically find a developer okay. who is you know a ton of experience maybe, maybe a you know masters in computer science yeah, worked at platform Google. To match. yeah and yes. then you can get tutoring one-on-one -on -one tutoring Good. and I think that really lowers the barrier to entry for a lot of people out there who exactly. want to learn how to code mm. um, and nowadays with all these hacker schools <laughs> and coding academies um, I mean, these things are expensive, yes. and not everyone can afford them, no. but with a great service like what this Taiwanese startup is providing, Code Mentor, that um, could change could the be, landscape. Yeah, yes. big game changer. All right. And Stephanie, you know, I mean, a lot of people, myself in particular, were fascinated by the fact that you were part of this, you know, beauty pageant last year in oh, 2015. Thank you. Let me ask you, what did you do, you know, throughout the, you know, the pageant process? What did you do in terms of the competition uh, for talent? Mm. You know, what What was the performance? Yeah, sure. Okay. So um, for talent, I actually chose to perform ukulele. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So right. I, I, I was, I, when I was uh, told that there would be a talent portion, yeah. uh, which is actually optional for the pageant. Really? Um, yeah, it's uh, optional. I thought it was mandatory no, for all the beauty pageants. No, 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 no. no. Okay. I kind of wanted to take it upon myself. I wanted to challenge myself a little bit. You know, Do something I, different. Exactly. Yeah, mm. I mean, um, you and I were having a conversation earlier about sort yeah. of my musical background. I yeah, played piano for quite some time, mm -hmm. um, California state champion, okay. when I was about 13 years old. Okay. Um, I, I was I was like, well, I could play piano for this thing, but, you know, I feel like, um, again, like wanted to challenge myself a little bit, uh, put myself out there in a different way, and so mm -hmm. I decided to perform ukulele. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually brought the ukulele with me here today, and okay. I'm happy to Please. play a bit yeah, <laughs> for okay. you Can you play you a little want. bit for us? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. But only if you do a little twist in your chair, yeah, though. Okay, I'll try. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do All you right. know um, I'm Yours by Jason Mraz, by mm, chance? But I'm, we're going to find out. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Well, you done done me and you bet I felt it. Tried to be chill, but you're so hot that I melted. I fell right through the cracks. Now I'm trying to get back. But for 
on the cool to run And I'd be giving it my best test Nothing's gonna stop me but divine intervention Reckon it's again my turn To win some or learn some But I won't hesitate no more No more It's cannot wait I'm yours That's wonderful, yeah? <laughs> yes, that's very nice Awesome, glad yes. you like it <laughs> well, I'm sure the viewers along with myself oh. Of course, we enjoyed that very much I But so. let me ask you, how did you and, and why did you pick up this instrument, you, you, you yeah. said about piano playing, mm -hmm. uh, other instruments you might have you know, mm -hmm. experimented with, but how about this? That's a great question. So a few years ago, I actually went to Hawaii for the very first time. Really? Yeah, um, right. out to Oahu. And um, everywhere I went, I just heard this beautiful ukulele music. And I was like, man, it's just such a stress reliever, <laughs> no, you know? Yes. And so I was like, I really want to learn how to play this thing. Of so course. when I went back to California, uh -huh. um, I, uh, I I found an instructor and, you know, learned how to pick up a few chords on YouTube. And yes. uh, I performed it for Miss Asian America. So Good. Yeah. I mean, of course, with your you know music background, this is certainly, you know, something that you can pick up. But it just certainly shows that... You're very good at you know newer things that you are Aww. able to pick it up fairly Thank you. quickly. Yes. That's very nice of you to say. I appreciate oh, well, that. I mean that. Thank okay. You. All right. And let's shift focus a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, Stephanie. About you know we learned mm -hmm. that you are a so-called a die-hard video gamer. Yeah, correct. And uh, <laughs> people with your background, you know, you went to a very nice university, one of the best in the U.S., mm -hmm. and you done very well in terms of a career development. You know, how and why would you have such a keen interest in video games? Mm. Was it because of, you know, family? Was it because of friends? Was it because of, you know, might have been a student organization that you affiliate with? You know, yeah. I mean, what was the reason? That's a great question. So um, I think video gaming has always been a very a large part of my life. I remember okay. when my dad brought home the, uh, I think it was 1998, okay. Nintendo SNES. Uh, right. It's like a purple and gray console. And um, a that very, was a big deal back then. Yeah, yes. it was a very big deal back then. Okay. Um, pretty much a game changer um, in terms of like new technology, in terms of gaming, very disruptive stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, my, you know, I just remember playing Super Mario All Star, Super Mario World with my brother and my sister. We'd spend, okay. you know, a, a few good uh, mm -hmm. chunks of the weekend playing, okay. and yes. I just really just spawned so much creativity, the storytelling, the colors, the characters, mm -hmm. and I've carried that very much with me uh, through much of my life. I'm a nostalgic gamer. Like every time I see um, something that I remember playing when I was a child, it just brings me so much joy. Okay. Um, and uh, I've kind of carried that over into my personal career, you know, having worked in games for the past few years. So. Yes. And let me ask you, I mean, a lot of the parents in Taiwan, and I'm sure as well in the States, mm -hmm. uh, nowadays would not really prefer their kids, <laughs> you know, playing with, you know, video games uh -huh. at very young age. Uh -huh. And how did you convince, or did you parents have a conversation with the, you know, um, the three of you, saying that you can only play one hour a day? Or sure. Um, my parents definitely, you know, exercised a certain amount of, uh, of discipline when okay. raising us. You know, my, myself, my brother, and my sister. And so obviously, we weren't uh, just permitted to play video games for hours on end every okay. single day. Mm -hmm. But um, I think um, so. You know, it was you know, mostly you know isolated till maybe weekends, a few hours okay. every weekend. But um, I think what I really do appreciate. You know, my parents exposing my siblings mm -hmm. and I to by bringing home that Nintendo. Of course, um, was the fact that they wanted to expose us to new technology um, and um, help us sort of become immersed in understanding mm -hmm. of um, sort of what's kind of hot out there in tech, mm -hmm. um, so that when we go out and have conversations with our friends, um, mm -hmm. we have something to talk about. We have something in common that we can share. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you are now, of course, recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot more in the community as mm -hmm. you know 2015 Miss Asian America and uh, people now starting to know that you're also into video games yeah <laughs> so do you think that with now your profile in the community mm -hmm. uh, is that gonna help maybe more women in the future uh, to pay attention to the video gaming industry to mm -hmm. learn more about STEM, mm -hmm. you know, learn more about science, technology, mm -hmm. engineering, and mathematics. Uh, do you think that at least indirectly mm -hmm. will serve as a, you know, a, a indicator, a mm -hmm. factor that the people, young women like yourself, 
can do well in many different areas, including video gaming industry. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, I, I mean, hopefully, you know, my becoming Miss Asian America and the fact that I do happen to be someone who's very passionate about technology and video yeah. games does inspire other women who are passionate about similar topics to speak up about yes. it. Mm -hmm. um, right now, actually, 50% of the video gaming audience mm -hmm. in terms of gamers are women. So there's actually a very large population of women out there. But okay. the unfortunate thing is that you know, sometimes women deal with harassment when they're gaming online with of other course. people. Mm -hmm. um, people who work in the gaming industry who are women also deal with sorts of harassment too. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of by being Miss Asian America, saying that, you know, I'm a woman technology, I'm a woman who works in video games, mm -hmm. and saying that, you know, I, I, you know, I'm brave. I'm being brave about it and speaking up about the fact that I am okay. in these industries. Right. Um, will hopefully encourage other women to, you know, to be, get involved. Yeah, to yeah. get involved and to be like, hey, you know, let's work together to create more of an equal, safe workplace for for all of us. Okay. Yeah. But I would suppose one of the obstacles or barriers that you have to break is uh, for the common people like myself. Mm. We we'll think of video games mm. as something for recreation only. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, you know, I don't think, you know, many people nowadays, you know, even though it's a huge market, mm -hmm. no doubt, but, you know, many people would not think that, hey, by spending all these hours in front of your computer, mm -hmm. playing video games, is that going to get you anywhere? Mm -hmm. Because you're probably, you know, pretty good at it, but someone else on the other side of the globe may be 10 times, you know, better than you are. Uh -huh. So how do you correct that stereotyping? you know, people have about video games? I think it's really just about speaking up about okay, it. Right. Um, I mean, the video gaming industry right now, it is, there's a lot of capital yes. involved in that. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of sales, um, of media sold, in terms of how big the video game market is, I think Call of Duty, in terms of sales, it outsold, I think, mm -hmm. um, uh, the Taylor Swift album and the Marvel <laughs> okay. movies, like combined, some crazy, like outrageous number of like that. So gaming is a huge industry. I think that if there are people out there who want to pursue a career in professional gaming, okay. um, like any other career in sort mm -hmm. of, maybe like any other niche career, like say in entertainment, it's going okay. to be challenging, right? But okay. I believe that if you're persistent, you put yourself out there, you network, um, make yourself like uh, um, famous on Twitch, create a YouTube channel. Um, anything's possible. Okay. So, yeah, if you yeah. try hard enough at it. Yes. And we also understand that you're now, you know, for example, you know, going on uh, kind of speaking tours, uh -huh. you know, going to different university campuses, mm -hmm. you know, talking to different organizations mm -hmm. about how for women to play a bigger role mm -hmm. in STEM areas. You know, for example, you and I were saying that at the end of, you know, January that you're going to be in you know, Berkeley, mm -hmm. you're going to be talking about, you know, this, you know, similar area, similar issues mm -hmm. to people who are interested. Mm -hmm. So do you think this is one of the more effective ways of, you know, kind of promoting gender equality, not just in the STEM areas, mm -hmm. but also across the board? And also this will be a, a very direct, you know, direct way for you to express the messages and the causes that you believe in. Yeah, definitely. I think the first step to creating awareness about any social issue is yes. by speaking up about it. Of course. Um, it's kind of, um, mm -hmm. that's why I really admire what Sheryl Sandberg did when she wrote the book Lean In, which yes. is encouraging mm -hmm. um, women to kind of speak up when they're in meetings and to champion for greater equality, whether you are a man or a woman in the mm -hmm. workplace, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think that yeah, simply by speaking up and is is enough to create that spark of awareness about something. And hopefully folks who are watching out there right now will maybe be inspired by our conversation and go back to their workplace, have a conversation with their friends, their coworkers about, okay. you know, how can we make the workplace more inclusive for okay. people of all races, all genders. All right. One minute left mm -hmm. in this part of the program. Uh, Stephanie, do you think... You know, you come back to Taiwan pretty much once a year at least. Mm -hmm. Do you think the situation in terms of gender equality has improved? Mm. So from my, my personal observation, observation, yes. observation only. Um, Not I, scientific? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'd have to read some. Uh, I, get, I need to get more data points, right? Oh, okay, but from no. my personal observation, um, in terms of startups, I see actually a good amount of gender parity. Good. You know, it's pretty 50-50. I, I think that there's an actual effort to hire an equal more amount women. of men and women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. However, in terms of the roles that females are in, it's still not more technical roles. It's I'm still, still that glass more ceiling. Women, yes, okay. in All marketing right. roles. Okay. So. All right. Definitely, let's talk a little bit about your belief and your, you know, uh, you know, causes 
of you know women empowerment mm -hmm. and also in terms of gender equality in the workplace. Right. And uh, people often say that education is one of the most effective ways, if not the most uh, effective way to balance the differences between the sexes, mm -hmm. all right? What is your view about education? Mm -hmm. you know, do you think education will be an effective way to eliminate not just gender equality, you know, inequality, but also in terms of poverty, mm. you know, illiteracy, of course, and other social economic inequalities? Mm. What do you think? Yeah, so, I mean, I can definitely speak for what's happening out in the West, um, okay. where people have more readily, where education is a bit more readily available, I imagine, in other parts okay. of the world, um, you know, where education is not The situation can is, be different. Yeah, it yes. can be very different, where, say, if women are completely excluded for ha from having a proper education, mm -hmm. um, definitely, um, you know, they're already set at a disadvantage when okay. it comes to career growth and, you know, gender equality, eventually, yes. um, when it comes to working. Um, but in the West, um, what people have observed, what studies have shown, is that young girls um, who are put through sort of a similar um, education system as bo young boys, you know, both boys and girls actually share the same, a relatively same amount of interest in pursuing careers in STEM. Mm. But just um, sort of as they progress, you know, through the education system, you know, growing up, different social pressures, whether from parents, career counselors, expectations, mm. you know, slowly we start to see the numbers of women who are interested in pursuing a career in STEM start to um, decline. Decline, exactly, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which is very unfortunate. Okay. And so, um, you know, for me personally, when I started working in high tech, um, a lot of times I started to become very self conscious about the fact that I was the mm -hmm. only um, woman in the room, if not only Asian American woman in the okay. room. Okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, given the fact that you've been talking to some of the local startups, mm -hmm. and uh, you mentioned earlier that, you know, the situation has improved, mm -hmm. but do you think that this is becoming a cause? Mm -hmm that are shared by many and uh, increasingly more and more women in Taiwan. Mm. They now come to realize that, hey, we do the same amount of work. We make the same kind of contribution. Uh -huh. We have study as well as you know, any other you know, person. Mm -hmm. How come we're not paid equally? Mm. Uh, how come we're not considered on uh, equal footing when mm. it comes to promotion, comes to page, you know, uh, wage races? Mm -hmm. You know, do you think that's a thing that more and more women in Taiwan are now becoming aware of? Um, you know, I think with movements like the Lean In movement that okay. Sheryl Sandberg has been promoting, you know, this whole notion of having more gender equality in the workplace may be more of a hot topic in Asia. Okay. Um, but um, I can't say that I've had an actual conversation <laughs> with a woman who works in startups who was like, man, it's so unfair here. <laughs> you know, like, no one's ever told me that. In the West, however, in the Bay Area, in Silicon Valley, where technology is booming, yes. there is definitely more mm. of um, a, 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 mic a lens that's being placed on, on this okay. topic for sure. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's now shift the focus a little bit on your own career development. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that you were with the, uh, the startup, you know, 500 startups. Yes, correct. And then you were the director of marketing, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what was your responsibility back then? Yeah, sure. So basically, um, I transitioned uh, from working with video gaming companies and mm -hmm. startups into a, a venture capital firm called okay. 500 Startups. They yes. actually have a uh, branch out here in Taiwan. They do? Yes, they do. Um, and um, basically, my role as director of marketing was a whole number of things like at, at 500 we were like a startup for startups okay. if that makes yes. sense no. um, so um, my job responsibilities could run anywhere from you know managing social media community uh, the Facebook page trying to unite all of the different online communities that we managed across the globe and under you know one cohesive umbrella of course. Um, all the way to you know one-on-one -on -one mentoring with okay. the startups okay. uh, that we invested in okay. so it was a whole variety of different responsibilities yeah why have you learned the most from that experience, mm. you know, being with a startup. Okay. I think um, the biggest takeaway for me it, what would definitely be how important it is to pursue what it is that you love, mm. and that sometimes, like when when sort of growing your own career. Um, Occasionally, you know, we may run into a big challenge or we'll trip up and we'll fall and we'll feel like, oh man, I just failed at this thing and okay. that sucks, right? And I think mm. a lot of startup founders go through that mm. um, sort of 
um, emotional, psychological cycle. Of course. Right? When they're mm -hmm. trying to fundraise, um, when they're trying to meet up with a journalist. Um, but at the end of the day, it, unless we um, go through those failures and those challenges, we never grow as people or, or our businesses or mm -hmm. our products. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think I would say that's the biggest takeaway. For All me. right. Yeah. And Being next, able to embrace failure. Yeah. OK. And next, in addition to your you know, current position as Miss you know, Asian America, mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit about your new project mm. on the Internet at YouTube. Yeah. You know, uh, regarding, you know, profiling entrepreneurs sure. around the globe. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the project. Sure, definitely. Um, so the project is called Sandbox. Sandbox, um, okay. Sandbox, and you can find it on YouTube or my Facebook uh, page, okay. which is facebook.com slash hello, Stephanie Lin. Okay, all right. <laughs> S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-L-I-N. -E okay. And um, basically, it's called Sandbox because there's a term in software development where mm. uh, code developers basically put all their experimental code, mm -hmm. and that's called Sandbox. Okay. Um, and mm -hmm. um, on this program, I basically interview different founders entrepreneurs, people who have big ideas and who've actually started something. And um, the idea is, is that uh, these founders open up about the challenges that they've overcome, some of the struggles they've experienced, um, so that other people who are watching who might be a struggling entrepreneur or founder, mm -hmm. you'd be like, wow, like that guy just raised $15 million, but at the same time, you know, he almost you know, there was a point in his career where he was only down to a thousand dollars in the mm, bank and he had, okay. you know, to support a team of like, you know, 10 people, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, it, I think that by sharing these stories mm. uh, with people around the world, we can uh, sort of, um, sort of creates more of a sense of empathy for mm -hmm. what founders go through, um, create more of a culture that is open to people who are willing to take risks to pursue their dreams of course. Um, in business, right. um, which I think is particularly important in mm. Asia, yeah, mm, where, okay. yeah, where pursuing something that's <laughs> as risky as starting a business can sometimes be frowned upon. So. Of course. And uh, you mentioned earlier by talking to the, some of the local startups mm -hmm. that uh, you felt, you know, some of it at least, just focus on the local markets, mm. all right? They're not thinking of regional, they're not thinking about, you know, global markets. Mm -hmm. And uh, given the fact that, you know, we are now in the global village, mm -hmm. you know, anything that happens in the, this part of the world will have an impact, mm -hmm. you know, the very next day you know, on the other side of the globe. Definitely. So what do you think, you know, as a former director of marketing, what would be the recommended marketing strategy mm -hmm. for many of the you know, local startups mm. who are thinking of not just the local Taiwan market, mm -hmm. but goes beyond Taiwan, beyond China, beyond Asia, but onto the global stage? Yeah. What would be something that you would recommend to, that would raise the international visibility? Right. Elevate the profile a little bit. Mm -hmm. So in terms of a marketing and PR tactic that I can okay. definitely recommend is, you know, to your point, definitely think more global and not so local. I mean, it's okay. great if you're able to build relationships with a lot of local journalists here. Mm -hmm. But if Taipei Times is the only one that's reporting on your business, that's not what's not going enough. to get you no. that global exposure. No. So I would recommend um, start building relationships with journalists overseas. Okay. Um, I know that Twitter is not you know, widely popular amongst Taiwanese people in general. No. But Twitter is a huge, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very popular, widely used channel amongst tech journalists in the Silicon Valley. And those journalists are the ones that are going to help you get that global exposure. Mm. TechCrunch, VentureBeat, these are publications that are read by people around the world. Mm -hmm. So I would start, you know, start engaging, try engaging in, conver in conversation with these journalists on Twitter. Reach out to them over email. And if you can, try and even fly out to the Silicon Valley yourself and go to a networking event. Um, the second tip I would have is to research, research, research on these particular journalists. Understand what it is that they write about, what they're passionate mm -hmm. about. Okay. Follow them on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And um, when you do your outreach to them and when you finally are able to get that face-to-face -face time with them at a mm -hmm. networking event, okay. to, you'll, you'll be well-versed in what it is that they like and you can pitch your business to them on the spot. And they may potentially write about it because right. sh you've shown them that you've done your research. Len, let me ask you this, mm -hmm. Stephanie. If we look at the same issue mm -hmm. from the other side, mm -hmm. you know, does the international you know, you know, journalist community or the you know, startup community or the venture capital community mm -hmm. really now has Taiwan on the map, mm. under the radar? Uh, are people paying more attention now to 
you know, startups in China, for example, everybody's talking about China, mm -hmm. talking about India, mm -hmm. uh, talking about Southeast Asia. Correct. Yeah. All right. And uh, even talking about, you know, Central and uh, Eastern Europe sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, is Taiwan really on the map, so to speak? Uh, people mm -hmm. really pay attention to Taiwan. Of course, they know about the TSMCs, the home sure. highs and things. Yeah. But would they really pay attention to some of the you know local startups that are just beginning? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, like I said, it's, yeah. a, it's a very direct question. It, What's your observation? You know, my observation is that there is slowly becoming more of an interest in mm. Taiwanese startups. Okay. Fortunately, okay. Um, you know, with investors like 500 Startups having an office out here, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the fact that Sequoia's India branch just invested a ton of money in Pinkoi, for example, which yes. is another Taiwanese startup, mm -hmm. um, I think that there slowly is becoming more of an interest. Um, and you know, it may just be more in recent months because, again, like the startup ecosystem has only just become more of a, a hot topic. Uh, a, a, a more, Recently, it's only started yes. growing in the last seven months or no. so. Yes. Um, so be as a result, um, mm. you know, slowly we are starting to see a little bit more of a focus. I'd love to see more. I think you and I Good. would love to see more. Yeah, of but, course, yeah. yeah. Maybe in, you know, in the future when you come back to Taiwan, you can see more changes in the area. I yes. love that. Stephanie, we've been talking about your career, talking about you know this and many other things. But one thing that we did not forget, or you know, you know, not that we forgot to cover it, <laughs> was the fact that you were one time a journalist, mm. okay, and you majored in mass communication at Berkeley. Correct. So tell us a little bit about that, you know, experience. And you were working in New York, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, how is that different from working on the West Coast or going to school, born and raised? in San Francisco. Yeah, sure. Um, so working as a journalist, you know, I was doing a lot of things that I really loved and the key aspect of it being storytelling and okay. really just being, just witnessing history unfold, being on the front okay. lines of watching what, that. What would be some of the stories that you covered? Um, I covered a, a wide variety of different okay. topics. Anything from sort of um, feature stories about uh, say teens in an underprivileged community and they're working to build actually boats like okay. actual boats together to uh, learn leadership and team building skills anything mm -hmm. from a story like that all the way to politics actually okay. so um, I actually uh, tapped back into my Taiwanese roots and um, got to know the Taiwanese American community out in New York and we actually covered some Taiwanese like political news, believe it or <laughs> okay. not so, good all right yeah. but uh, we also understand that you know, the United States is electing a new president mm -hmm. in November of 2016. Correct. And uh, how would you then compare the video, uh, I mean, the uh, media environment in the two countries, mm -hmm. in the U.S. and in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. And how do you think, as a former you know journalist yourself, the U.S. media will cover the upcoming November election in the U.S.? Mm. Yeah, so in general, when it comes to election coverage, it means big ratings, of course. frankly, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, election coverage is generally very, very aggressive, 24-7, yeah. um, mm -hmm. um, generally the lead story for a lot of local news affiliates, mm -hmm. and on the 24-7 news cable channels, well, it's kind of everywhere, yeah. right? So, um, you know, the idea is fundamental to being a great journalist, I think, is to be objective, okay. practice objectivity, don't okay. show any bias, right? Okay. So ideally, when when um, telling, when, when reporting on elections, um, you know we're showcasing um, the perspectives of every single candidate, every single party. However, as you and I both know, mm -hmm. a lot of times, um, like for example, like with Fox News, yes. you know, it's got a little bit more of a rightist slant. Mm -hmm. Whereas, mm -hmm. say with MSNBC, conventionally, a lot of people say that, oh well, they're a little bit more liberal. Mm -hmm. So um, I, that sort of model, um, mm -hmm. one could say, is also shown in, is also um, displayed in Taiwan news yes. media, mm -hmm. um, where some, some may yes. a bit. May may show a bit more preference toward a particular party. So, mm. I mean, That yeah. happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I will also imagine, because the U.S. is so much bigger mm -hmm. in terms of land size, mm -hmm. that when you cover the election in November, you probably need to travel with the candidates mm -hmm. in different parts of the country. Right. And uh, different parts of the country, the local people may have very different concerns. Their priorities are different. You know, for example, if you go to some of the agricultural states, they're concerned about the agriculture, you know, products they produce, whether it's going to be able to export the 
you know, fairly into other markets. And when you talk, you know, when you go to some of the manufacturing states like Pennsylvania and things, they concerned about, you know, some of the, you know, trade barriers that mm -hmm. other countries may impose. Mm -hmm. So do you think that the differences in different parts of the U.S., would that really be a challenge for people like yourself, a former, you know, journalist yourself, mm -hmm. that uh, to cover the election in a very objective way and also try to be as comprehensive as possible. Right. So um, in terms of issues that are more applicable to folks who live in certain areas, mm -hmm. I would think that it's only fair, for example, um, you know, that the local news affiliates in those particular areas make okay. sure to cover those yes. topics mm -hmm. um, while um, also speaking to how, say, the, the Republican Party um, cares about those particular issues and how the Democrats care about those particular issues and mm. so on and so forth. Okay. So it's, I, don't, I wouldn't say that covering an issue that is more important to people in a particular area okay. is um, biased in any particular way. It's just no. relevancy. Okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, let's now come back to, you know, Miss Asia America, that uh, after holding on to the title for a few months now, what do you think? You now, given the fact that they're probably giving you some assignments, <laughs> you, know, you have your duties to, you know, fulfill. What, what is the most important quality or element in being Miss Asian America? I think it's really about having a cause that you believe in and just championing that okay. to the best of your ability. All right. um, for me, it's about seeing more women in technology mm -hmm. and how I'm doing that is by speaking up, about okay. it, generating more awareness that mm -hmm. this is a social issue. All right. Right? And hopefully by speaking up about it, you know, we can help instill some change. Okay. Um, and um, so I would say that, yes, it's about really having a cause that you believe in wholeheartedly, okay. being a good role model in All that right. way. Yeah. All right. For the young women out there who are watching our program today, mm -hmm. they may say, hey, Stephanie has done it. You know, I'm interested in being a part of a pageant someplace, mm -hmm. whether Taiwan or the U.S. Sure. You know, what would be your advice to them? What, what would be some things that they can prepare themselves for? You know, picking up a ukulele, for example. <laughs> yeah, sure. What would be something that they need to get ready for? Yeah, so I think the important thing to have in mind when participating <clears throat> in, say, the Miss Asian America, Miss Asian Global pageant okay. um, would really be to understand why it is that you're doing it. Okay. Um, because at the end of the, because it is a competition, right? Yes. It's, it's a little nerve wracking. There's anxiety involved. <laughs> yes. There's a lot of training, like, you know, mental willpower that you got to, you know, put yourself through. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it can get tough. So mm -hmm. remembering why it is that you wanted to participate in something like mm -hmm. this competition in the first place is, okay. um, and holding mm -hmm. on to that through those tough times is what's, is, is going to be really key. So um, make sure you're participating for the right reasons and okay. that you have that core reason to hold on to. Um, so I think that would be the, the most okay. important quality. All right. Yeah. And Stephanie, you know, you being Miss Asian America for about, you know, almost six months. Mm -hmm. And uh, how has that experience, you know, being part of the pageant, now holding, you know, the title? And then the, how has that experience changed you as yeah. a person? You know, has it given you more exposure that comes with more responsibility, giving you a wider vision? <laughs> about how to look at people, look sure. at things, uh -huh. you know, look at the different causes. Uh, there are some things maybe you are not interested in or knew very little about. Now you, you have the opportunity to find out more about those. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So i actually only been Miss Asian America for about four months. Okay, all right, no <laughs> Three, problem. Three, four months. Okay. Um, but uh, in, the time, yeah, in, okay. in the time that... Uh, uh, I've been the title holder. I have to say that um, it's really helped open a lot of doors in terms of me being able to really champion okay. this cause of seeing more women in technology. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I would say that it, it, opportunities to you know be on the show and chat with you and talk okay. about this topic. Of course. Um, and it's been incredible, sort of seeing you know the process of me becoming Miss Asian America, the amount of support. 
that the Taiwanese American community has provided to me. Mm. And that has inspired me so much that, you know, I came back to Taiwan and I'm like, I want to give back. I want to, you know, help Taiwanese startups here um, through mentorship, through just doing what I can through my professional experience to help them grow. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I would say that at least in these past four months, that's uh, kind of been my perspective. I just want to give back. I want to help. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, if you were given the opportunity to do it again, would you do it? Yeah. I in a second. Right. I actually would do it in a second. Um, All right. You know, I remember my, my parents actually flew back to Taiwan. They, we, there's, there's an ethnic costume portion okay. of the competition where you show off like um, mm -hmm. something beautiful about your culture. And okay. my parents actually came back to Taiwan. They uh, worked with like an Aborigine group to create this beautiful costume. And I remember uh, wearing it on stage and just being so proud to represent Taiwan in cool. that outfit. And um, just giving Taiwan that global platform. exposure. Exposure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So Good. I'm just, just proud. Finally, before we close out the program today, that Stephanie, what's your next career move? Mm -hmm. You're not working on the sandbox, you know, project. Mm -hmm. But I would not suppose is something that's gonna be ongoing forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, what would you like to do next? I mean, that's a great question. You know, we'll see where Sandbox goes. Okay. You know, um, I'm very excited to continue interviewing and getting to know different entrepreneurs for the program and mm. hopefully through those stories, inspiring other startup founders to of continue course. pursuing their business endeavors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that I'm strong in terms of the video gaming industry, in mm. terms of marketing. Okay. Um, but, you know, like, well, I'm, in terms of like long term plans, you know, mm. I'm pretty flexible. We'll see where life takes me. I just am very excited to um, continuing to champion women in technology, supporting okay. the Taiwanese startup community, and um, yeah, utilizing my skills where they may best fit. Okay, I'm sure that with your qualifications and experiences, there will be a lot more options available for you in the future. Oh, thank and you. By the way, you know, a lot of, a lot of people will look at you as a bi, you know, cultural product, mm -hmm. you know, one in Taiwan and one in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Would you consider yourself then maybe, you know, in the future, unofficially being a goodwill ambassador <laughs> between Taiwan and the U.S.? Help the two sides to get to know each other a lot more, not just in terms of politics, economics, but also culturally, mm -hmm. uh, ideologically, in terms of social, you know, lifestyles and things. Mm -hmm. Would you like to play that role? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I kind of feel that hopefully I already am starting yeah, to play that role. Yeah, of course. But now you have bit. the title, but without <laughs> the title in the future, would you continue to perform? In such a capacity? Um, yes. Um, okay. You know, honestly, I will always be the first Taiwanese American Miss Asian America. Of course. And so I, again, very proud to represent the Taiwanese people. I mm. look forward to continuing to build that bridge and that okay. strength and that relationship between the U.S. and Taiwan. Terrific. Stephanie, it's wonderful to have you on the program today. I certainly want to wish you all the best in your personal and professional endeavors in the future. Thank, thank you. you. Thank all you right. so much. I appreciate it. No problem. And thank you for watching our program today. I'll see you next time on Microfeed Television. Thank you.